Hi, my name is Greg Braden. I want to begin by saying thank you to you for clicking on the button that is linking us together today in this, this virtual conversation. I am a five-time New York Times bestselling author. I'm a scientist. I'm a researcher. I'm an explorer. And there's a beautiful place where all of those things come together to tell us something about ourselves, to reveal new discoveries that help us to become better people, the best versions of ourselves, to create stronger families, stronger communities. And it all comes down to a secret that is almost universal in ancient and indigenous traditions. And that's what I want to talk to you about right now. I am a multidisciplinary scientist. I have a, a primary degree in the earth science, uh, uh, geophysics, a very strong background in life sciences and biology molecular biology, molecular chemistry, math, physics, computer science, archaeology, and cosmology. And I say this to you because it is that multidisciplinary background that has allowed me to stay current with the publications, the obscure technical journals over the years, revealing new discoveries that give us new ways to think about ourselves and, and new ways to solve our problems. We all need that because our world is changing. That's no secret. Your world is changing. My world is changing. What those changes mean is we've got to think differently about ourselves and about our relationship to the world to solve the problems that life is bringing to our doorstep. Well, it may be new for us, but I have to tell you that our ancestors faced many challenges, very similar to what we face today. The archeological records are showing us that the uh, Native American people on North America, they faced climate change 5,000 years ago. We thought it was new for us. They faced the drought, they faced the heat, the extremes, they faced social unrest, social pressure and war from other tribes. And they had to come to terms with what these changes meant in their lives. You know, the scenery's changed, but our lives may not be so very different from theirs today. Because our world is changing, we need new ways to think about ourselves. There's a tendency in science to discount the wisdom of our ancestors. There's a tendency to say, if it's not proven by science, that it doesn't exist. And that may serve some engineering purposes, you know, for building a rocket ship to, to space. But for everyday life, I want you to know that there's a continuity that exists. We are standing upon the shoulders of the discoveries of our ancestors, and we can benefit from the wisdom of what they know that we have forgotten and in some cases, what they know that we are still, still learning to discover. So one of those, one of those discoveries, so fascinating to me, this is what I want to share with you in this conversation. As a scientist, I have spent the bulk of my adult life, I've been blessed to spend the bulk of my adult life traveling to some of the most magnificent, remote, isolated, pristine, beautiful places remaining in the world today, first to understand the history of the people and then to be with the people today in their present state, to talk with them, to look with them in the eyes and ask them the deep questions of our existence. Who are we? Where do we come from in your tradition? What do we do to make life better in your tradition? And from the, the diversity of these experiences. I mean, I, I've spent, I had the opportunity to lead groups into the highlands of, of central China and the Tibetan plateau, the late 1990s into the 2000s. We would lead groups on, on 26 day journeys, 12 monasteries, two nunneries, almost 18,000 feet above sea level to be with the people that hold these secrets. I've been with the, the mystics and the yogis in India and Nepal and the temples of India and Nepal for the same reasons. I've been all through 36 years, I've been leading groups and spending time with the indigenous people, the, the, the healers, the Kurundaros, the Quechuan people of the southern Andes Mountains of Peru and under the Altiplano of Peru. And spent time in Australia with the indigenous people, the Bedouins of the Egypts of, or the, the deserts of Egypt all through the American desert Southwest, the indigenous traditions and much more. And, and I'm, I'm saying this to you because as different as these traditions are from one another, there's a common theme that brings them all together. That common theme is what is important to you and I in our lives today. The common theme is this, in times of difficulty, 
these ancient traditions, these people have always turned to words in times of need for comfort, for strength, for protection, to help them come to terms with the change in our lives. They've always used words to help them in difficult times and not just any words. And this is the thing, I've been with people, I've been with these people when they had revolutions in their country, when there've been massacres in their country, I've been with them during war, I've been with them when their children have died and when their parents have died. And it's these very intimate, very real human experiences. This is where you get to know someone. You get to know who they are in the rawness of their life challenges and how they respond to those life challenges. So in the presence of, of these challenges, the words that they have turned to are very precise. They don't use random words like, oh God, help me get through this. They're very precise words that they use. And so I began to ask them, why are these words the words that you will always turn to? And what I found is this, is that every culture has specific patterns of words that are preserved in chants, in mantras, in hymns that they have used during times of need, and they've been preserved in these ways, passed down from mother to daughter, from father to son, generation to generation, civilization to civilization. They even share them with civilizations, some of them 5,000 years, some of them go back 7,000 years in the case of the Hindu Vedas. So my dream has been to categorize, to, to catalog these words, these very, very powerful word codes that are called wisdom codes, to bring them together from these many different and diverse traditions and catalog them according to use. Some of them fall under the category of fear. What words have ancestors of ours always used to help them transcend the fear that comes up in their lives? A lot of different kinds of fear. Sometimes we fear things that we can see immediately, we know how to remedy, a lot of times we fear things that we cannot see. Those are the ones that are not so easy to deal with because in order to transcend the fear, something has to change within us. We must change our perception of the fear in order to transcend that challenge. The same thing is true when we feel the need for protection or when we need strength in times of, of chaos or to survive the loss of our loved ones. These are universal experiences. Every human tradition has had them. So I've had the opportunity to do just that. I've collected for over 40 years, I have collected the wisdom codes from many different traditions, from the ancient Upanishads, the Hindu traditions that do in fact go back 7,000 years, the Mahabharata, the Bhagavad Gita, the Sanskrit traditions of the, the, the Buddhist, Tibetan Buddhist, as well as traditional Buddhist traditions from under the pyramids of Egypt, there are entire scripts that are written as instructions to the soul while the soul is living in terms of, of how to transcend the challenges of passing from this life to the next. We find these word codes in the Gnostic traditions, in the Christian traditions. We find them in the Essene traditions, 500 years before the time of Jesus. This mysterious sect called the Essenes showed up with this intense wisdom you know, the Egyptians recognized the Essenes as learned people. They actually called them. They didn't call them the Essenes. Uh, what they called them were healers because they knew that they had the power to, to heal both their bodies physically, emotionally, spiritually, psychologically. So I've had the opportunity to bring all of these together, but it was only recently that the science has caught up with the wisdom of our ancestors. I want to share with you a little bit about what the science is all about. Andrew Newberg is a neuroscientist, very well known neuroscientist. He's an author as well. I'm gonna paraphrase a statement that he says of the power of words, because sometimes we have the tendency to discount words. You say, oh, you know, it's just a word. You know, what, what power could that have? Well, Andrew Newberg answers that. He says, one word, a single word has the power to change the genes in our bodies when it comes to fear and when it comes to healing and when it comes to stress, a single word has the power to change those genes. If a single word has the power to change the genes inside of our DNA, literally, literally, this isn't a metaphor, to upregulate the genes 
for more health, more healing, more regeneration, more rejuvenation, or the opposite of all that, the single word can downregulate those genes depending on what that word is. If, if one word can do that, then what do these patterns of words do? What power do they have in our lives? And, and how have these ancient word codes helped our ancestors in the past? One of the reasons they have been preserved for thousands of years is simple, it's because they work. And if these word codes have worked for the ancient Christians when they were in the Middle East, if they've worked for the Egyptians, if they've worked for the, the healers and the Kurandaros and the shamans and the mystics and the yogis all over the world for so long, if they've worked for them, there's a really good chance they're gonna work for us as well. Now, I know this is a very different way of thinking for many of us because we live in a modern world. We live in a modern world where our traditions are based upon science. Well, I wanna to say to you that science, first of all, it's, it's a, a relatively new way of thinking. Science is only about 300 years old. We say that science began uh, approximately 300 years ago when Isaac Newton formalized the laws of physics. So for 300 years, We've used science to help us interpret our world. And if science failed in doing that, we have discounted the phenomenon. We have said, if you can't see it, you can't measure it, then it doesn't exist. It's not real. Well, you know, that thinking has eliminated an entire dimension of experience, the spiritual experience, the experience of consciousness that physics is, de is, is dealing with or struggling with right now. Physics is having a hard time unifying the laws of physics into a single eloquent equation, into a single story, because they have omitted the fundamental factor of consciousness as a force in the universe. They're beginning to come to terms with that, of course, and, and all that's changing. So I'm saying this to you to acknowledge that what I am sharing, I know it's a very, very different way of thinking, but I gotta tell you, it works. I'm gonna share some examples with you. I use this stuff in my personal life. Because we're all going through difficult times right now. We're all dealing with loss. We're dealing with the loss of loved ones. We're dealing with the loss of ways of life. Entire ways of life now have changed. We're dealing with a world that is changing faster than we can document it in our classrooms and our textbooks. And there's a new world that's emerging, but it's not quite here yet. So we are this very special generation. You are part of a very special generation that is living in the in-between time. You're living in a world where the familiar things of the past are disappearing. A new world is in front of us, it's emerging, but it's not quite here yet. And you are living with a foot in both of those worlds and you're doing your very best, I know you are, to raise your family, to have a job, to stay healthy, to have some kind of, a, of an intimate relationship with another human all without being lost in the fear of the uncertainty of what comes next. It's where these wisdom codes are so powerful because the human experiences you and I are having now, it might be new to us, they're not new to the world. What scientists like Andrew Newberg are saying to us is that when we shift our perceptions and when we shift the words that we use to describe our experiences, we're literally changing the physiology of our beings. And I think you're familiar with the term plasticity. We hear this a lot with, with brain tissue, with neuroplasticity, the ability to, to shift and adapt neurons. Well, that principle, it goes beyond the brain. It now applies to our entire body. Bioplasticity, the ability to shift every organ, every system in the body, genetic plasticity, the ability to literally shift the DNA and the expression of the genes within the DNA. It all comes down to something called epigenetics. Epigenetics is a relatively new science that says that our bodies, our systems, our DNA, our genes change in response to the environment that they find themselves in. The environment can mean a lot of things. It can be the physical environment, hot, cold, wet, dry. It can be a nutritional environment. How do we nourish our bodies? It can be a supplement environment. What kind of supplements do you take? All those are important. What the science is showing is that the most powerful environment, the environment that has the greatest influence over our very being, the essence, the blueprint of our being, it's not about the weather, it's not about the temperature, or about nutrition, it's the emotional environment. It's how you feel about 
your world and what's happening in your world. Do you feel safe? Do you feel threatened? Do you feel a sense of well-being? Do you feel anxious? And all of the variations of that. So the word codes of our ancestors were designed without the science. They didn't, I'm not saying they were scientists. They didn't know maybe the mechanism, but they definitely understood the result. They understood the impact. They understood the application of how we use these patterns of words in our lives to shift our perspective, to change the way we interpret what the world is bringing to us. You can't always change the world, but you can always determine your response to what the world is showing you. That's the power, your unique power. And I just, I wanna look you right in the eye and I wanna say this, no other form of life can do what I am talking to you about right now. You and I are the only form of life that can consciously sit down in a moment in time and say, in this moment, I choose. I choose to change my response to the world. I choose to change the way I feel about my loss or about my fear or about whatever it is that's happening, whether it's the loss of a relationship and, and a breakup or the loss of a parent or a child or the loss of a way of life or the loss of a job, regardless of how that's happening, you're the only form of life that has the ability to choose. The word codes will help you to do that. And they have worked for thousands of years for our ancestors. I'm gonna give you an example here in just a moment. But what I, I want to say, I want you to understand the mechanism because there's something real happening here. This is based upon rock solid science. It's based upon science that rarely is shared in the mainstream. You won't see this stuff in mainstream textbooks, mainstream classrooms, mainstream documentaries, typically on the cable network channels. They're not showing this stuff. And I think a lot of the reason, number one, it's new. Number two, the discoveries are made in different fields of science and science is compartmentalized. So rarely do you see biology and geology and archeology span and cosmology and chemistry and neuroscience and cardioscience all come together in this really beautiful way. And that's precisely what I'm talking to you about right now. We are the generation that can draw upon all of these many kinds of wisdom weave them together into a knowledge that's more than anything that we've had in the past. That gives us the evolutionary edge to rise above, to transcend, to thrive in the presence of a changing world where other people have given up and societies have collapsed because they didn't know what to do. It all comes down to the way we think. This is the most powerful thing that you and I can do is to shift our thinking to adapt to this changing world. We're the only form of life that can do it. All right, so let me give you an example of what I'm talking about here. 400 years ago, the high deserts of the United States of America, the, the American desert Southwest, they were going through climate change. There was a drought. It hadn't rained for a long period of time. Crops died, animals died because there was no crop to feed the animals. People were starving. Tribes were competing with one another for what little food and little water there was. Can you imagine the stress? They didn't have the internet. They didn't have all the luxuries we have today, but they had to deal with those same problems. Well, 400 years ago, the ancient Navajo is the term that's given to the indigenous people of the Four Corners area of the United States. There, there is a place where four states touch. It is Colorado, Utah, Arizona, and New Mexico. And I'm coming to you today from Santa Fe, New Mexico. So I'm, I am 25% of the Four Corners area. The Navajo called themselves a Diné. So this is the ancient Diné people. They had to come to terms with the suffering. They had to find a way to turn their internal pain into something in their world that would help them and their children survive. And they did it through a prayer, such a powerful prayer that I'm going to share with you right now. It's called the Navajo Prayer of Beauty or the Beauty Prayer. Sometimes it's called the Beauty Way. Now, the prayer in its entirety, used formally in ceremonies, it's a long prayer. It's very lengthy. There's an abbreviated informal version that was shared uh, years ago by a native uh, Navajo artist. He's a fine artist. His name is Shanto Bigay. And Shanto Bigay describes only three phrases of this powerful beauty prayer. I use this almost every day of my life, at least once in my life, because beauty plays such a powerful role in my personal life. You know, when we think about beauty, 
we often think of it as this aesthetic. So we look at something, a piece of art or sculpture, or mountains or the trees, we say, oh, that's beautiful. I'm looking out the window at the beautiful mountains here in Santa Fe right now. They, they are, they're beautiful. The Navajo took this one step further. They embraced beauty as a force of nature, literally a force of nature, just the way physicists today describe four fundamental forces. They say gravity is a force of nature. The electromagnetic field is a force of nature. The strong and the weak nuclear force, those are forces of nature. The Navajo agree, and they say, by the way, there is a fifth force. It is the force of beauty. Now, I'm, I'm just going to admit right now, this is, I know this is very different, to think of beauty as a fundamental force. But I also want you to know that you and I are changed in the presence of beauty. When we perceive beauty, there's a shift in the chemistry of our bodies. That shift sets into motion a cascade of events that create neuroplasticity, bioplasticity, genetic plasticity. And it gives us strength. It gives us power to transcend what we see in our lives. The beauty prayer is designed to do just that. So the abbreviated version, let me give you the three lines, then we'll break it down in terms of, of what each line means. The three lines of the beauty prayer simply state, the beauty that I live with, the beauty that I live by, the beauty upon which I base my life. The beauty that I live with, the beauty that I live by, the beauty upon which I base my life. And what, what does that mean? The first statement is so powerful. The beauty I live with, what it says to us is that we do not have to create beauty to experience it. The beauty already exists. Our job is to seek it out. Our job is to find it. Now, it's not saying that everything that happens in the world necessarily is beautiful. Because honestly, you and I know that's not true. Not everything that happens is beautiful. However, it's saying that somewhere we can find beauty in everything that happens. Now, let me give you an example of this. And Mother Teresa is the example that always comes to mind for me. I have so much respect uh, for Mother Teresa and her mission with the Sisters of Charity, uh, a hospice organization based originally in Calcutta that would go into the streets of Calcutta before dawn every day, and they would find the people that had been cast out by their families because of their disease. They're called untouchables. And they were cast out into the streets to die. And Mother Teresa and her sisters of charity, they would find these people. They would pick them up, take them back to the hospice. They would bathe them and dress them in white gowns so that they were clean and had dignity in the last moments or hours of their lives. No matter how much longer they were in this world, they were clean and they had white garments to honor them as they made the transition from this world to the next. What a powerful thing. Well, Mother Teresa would say in those streets of Calcutta, they were filthy streets amongst the filth and the dung, the cow dung, and the stench and the garbage and the carcasses of other animals that were out there. She would see a flower growing in, in the cow dung. And she'd say, ah, in that flower, I see beauty in the streets of Calcutta. It was already there. She had to allow for its possibility. When we live our lives with the expectation that beauty already exists everywhere, we are changed in the presence of that beauty. That's the first statement. The beauty I live with. The beauty that I live by is the next statement. And it simply is an invitation for us to allow beauty to play a role in our lives beyond being an aesthetic. To allow beauty to become a force in our lives. Once again, when we allow for that potential, when we expect beauty somewhere in all things, we begin to see the world very differently. The third statement says that, the beauty upon which I base my life. It is the invitation for beauty to become a foundation, a cornerstone, not on the back burner, not something casual that we embrace on occasion but to recognize that beauty literally is a force in all things and to allow that force to play a powerful role in our lives. And I want to tell you from my own personal experience, when you accept beauty into your life in this way, you are changed. You're changed as a person. I'll, 
I'll just be uh, honest. I was, uh, in the interest of time, I was not going to share this, and, and I will. Uh, many of you know I worked in the corporations as a scientist. I worked in the universities as a scientist. And I left all of that in 1990 to write full-time, to travel and to research these ancient traditions and cultures as a scientist. And when I left the corporations, I'd always been in big cities. You know, I'd been in big, beautiful cities that were convenient, close to work. Everything I needed was at my fingertips. And I asked myself when I left, I'm starting a new chapter in my life, is what I said. Do I want to wake up every morning surrounded by convenience? Or do I want to wake up every morning surrounded by beauty? Well, I'd already done the convenience thing. Beauty won out. And this is the reason that I live uh, in an inconvenient place in the high deserts of northern New Mexico, an hour from the nearest grocery store, four hours from the, the nearest airport, and in one of the most absolutely stunningly beautiful, raw, magnificent, natural environments that I could ever find because it makes my soul sing. It's where I'm at my best. So beauty has always played a powerful role in my life. And for that reason, I'm drawn to the beauty prayer. So this particular patterning of words that the Navajo use, when we apply it in our lives, there is a technique where we align our heart and our brain together, where we become coherent in our bodies. And it's in the presence of, of that technique where the, many of you have heard me share in, in other, other traditions, uh, other programs. I know many of you are familiar with, with my work, or the, the work of the Institute of Heart Math, for example, a pioneering research organization based in Northern California who, who pioneered the techniques that they have allowed me to share with you as an independent author. It's in the presence of heart-brain coherence when we drop these word codes into our physiology in the presence of coherence this is where they are most potent, where they have the deepest effect. And the reason is very, very interesting. The reason is because heart-brain coherence opens the door to a direct link with the subconscious mind. It's a hotline. It's like picking up that red telephone on the president's desk and calling another president. It's you picking up your heart phone and calling your subconscious. If you want to bring about meaningful change, in the patterns of your life, you've got to access the subconscious mind. Some people have used hypnosis to do that. You can do that, but you don't have to do that. Maybe you're not around anyone that can help you with hypnosis, and you don't need to be. Because when you create that heart-brain coherence, you open the direct door to the subconscious mind. And when your subconscious begins to perceive the power of beauty differently, you are changed. Your body chemistry changes. Your neurons begin to wire and fire to reflect that perception. Your immune system is enhanced. Your longevity enzymes are awakened. You create more resilience to life and you increase heart rate variability just from the experience that I'm talking about right now. And this is only one experience of one wisdom code. Okay, and this wisdom code is from the, the Dine, the Navajo traditions. The wisdom codes, once I began to understand this, I began to go back and look and, and say, how many other codes are there from, from other traditions? And this is the result of what I have now grown to call the Wisdom Codes Collection. It is the collection of the, the Sanskrit and the Upanishads and the Hindu and all these different traditions and the Wisdom Codes that have worked for them in their lifetime. So I wanted to share this with you today uh, because I want you to have this kind of information. I want you to have this to apply in your life. You have everything you need right now. If you never see me again, you have a very powerful wisdom code based upon the beauty prayer of the ancient Dine people that you can apply in your life. The technique that I'm going to share with you, it's really exciting. It all begins in 1991 with a discovery that surprised the medical community, surprised the scientific community, and it's the foundation of what sets you apart from all other forms of life in the world today. 1991, there was a discovery of about 40,000 specialized cells in the human heart. Now, they'd always been there, 
Obviously, they were simply recognized in 1991. They're called sensory neurites. They're essentially brain-like cells, but they're not in the brain. They're in the heart. And they function in the heart very similar to the way that these neurons function in the brain itself. Now, on your screen, what you're seeing right now, two things. I want you to see on the right-hand side of your screen, <clears throat> you're actually looking at the neurons. This is what they look like. And, and I put these here because I want you to see that this is real. This isn't a metaphor. It's not make-believe. It's not you know, new thought thinking. This is rock-solid science that simply is not being shared in the mainstream. You're not going to see this in mainstream classrooms, textbooks, mainstream documentaries, because it takes time for the discoveries to trickle down into the mainstream. Yet we can use these discoveries right now in our lives for the reasons that we're talking about now, to help empower us. The better you know yourself, the better equipped you are to deal with change in your life. And this, this is a key component of empowering yourself in the change. Now on the left side of your screen is a schematic diagram of the human heart. And if you look closely, all those little light dots that you see, the light colored dots, those are the sensory neurites. Look at where they're located. They're located all around the places where the blood enters into the heart and where the blood leaves the heart. The arteries and the valves all are regulated. I'm using that word intentionally. I'm not saying they're controlled. I'm saying they are regulated through these neurons, these sensory neurites, well, this is where it gets really interesting because these neurons, as all other neurons, respond to you. They respond to your perceptions and the way you feel about your relationship to the world. Do you feel safe? Do you feel threatened? Do you feel fear? Do you feel a sense of well-being? The answer to that determines the signal that you send to these neurons, and that signal is going to determine how the blood is leaving your heart and entering your heart. But you already know this. You know this intuitively. If someone tells you information that is shocking to you, you might feel that sense of lightheadedness, maybe a little bit dizzy. And the reason is because you have perceived information that you didn't know about. It may have a shocking consequence, maybe the loss of a loved one your neurons are going to shut down or open up the blood flow to your heart. If it's shocking news, it will actually constrict some of that blood flow into the brain and you'll feel that lightheaded feeling. And this is the reason. It's also the reason that you can learn to regulate how you respond to that kind of information. So I want you to see these neurons, look at where they're located. And this is why it's so powerful. Now, I'm really excited. The image that you're looking at right now beyond the schematic. This is the first three-dimensional map of the heart's nervous system. So you're actually looking at, at the image of the human heart. And if you look towards the top, the yellow, all the little yellow that I'm highlighting for you right now, those little yellow areas, those are where the sensory neurites are primarily located. It's the first time we've been able to map these uh, physically in a living human heart. It's exciting. I'm sharing this with you now because we're going to begin accessing those neurons. And when we do, I want you to know that you're accessing a part of yourself that is unique to the human being. No other form of life can access consciously, at will, on demand, the neurons in the way that you and I are about to do to self-regulate your biology, to self-regulate. What's that mean? Self-regulation is what allows you to choose your response to the world around you. Remember, the better you know yourself, the better equipped you are to deal with changes in your world. So rather than reacting to what the world is giving you, this relationship between your perceptions, these neurons, and where they're located in the heart, empowers you. This is one of the highest levels of mastery that you can imagine. It empowers you to choose the way your body is going to respond. We're going to go through the technique to do it. So these neurons, I want you to know that the neurons in the heart, they're arranged just like a neural network in the brain, certainly not as large as the one in the brain, 
but they are arranged as a neural network in the brain. The neurons in your heart, they learn independently of the neurons in the brain. They think independently. They experience, they have their own independent memory. Separate from the neurons in the brain, separate yet related. The neurons in the heart is where we access our heart intelligence. This is where we access our deepest states of intuition. So what this says to you is every experience that you'll ever have in your life, you're essentially, essentially you're having it in two places. You're having it in your brain, you're having it in your heart. So what this says to you is that for every experience you will ever have in your life, the greatest joys, the deepest sorrows, the greatest suffering and the greatest states of ecstasy, you're experiencing them in two places, in the neural network of the brain and the, the neural network of the heart. Now, if your experiences are joyous experiences, then rarely is there any problem. You rarely hear people say, you know, God, I'm having so much joy in my life. Uh, I need to reel it in. You know, they don't go to a therapist to, to reel in the joy that they're having in their lives. But we all have trauma from time to time, different kinds of trauma for different people. And when we have that trauma, it is experienced in two different places, in the cranial brain and in the neural network of the heart as well. And this is the reason it's important to access both of these networks for our healing when it comes to resolving what those traumas have meant in our lives. And the technique that we're about to experience is one of the techniques to do just that. Now, I want you to know that the technique that we're going to use it has so many functions, and I'm going to zero in on a specific function that serves us for the wisdom codes, but I'm also going to share with you that there are many other aspects of this technique that can serve you in really, really beautiful, very powerful ways. I'm gonna begin talking about what we call a soft technology. When people think about technology, they usually think about computers, wires, chips, chemicals, you and I, we are a soft technology. We're not computer chips and wires and chemicals. We're neurons, cell membranes, ion fluids moving the potential across cell walls. That is a soft technology, a highly advanced, technologically sophisticated soft technology. You and I have the ability to do something that no other form of life can do. And that's what I wanna to say to you. I wanna share this with you right now. Because we have a neural network in the brain, we have a neural network in the heart. Two separate organs, but look at this. We're the only form of life that can harmonize two organs into a single potent system in our lives. We can harmonize that neural network in the heart and the brain, bring the network, the neural networks together to serve us in a way that no other form of life can do at will, on demand, consciously, when they choose. Wow, that is what makes you such a very powerful being. This is one of your highest levels of mastery, is the ability to do this. When we harmonize the heart and the brain, the technical word is called coherence. Heart, brain, coherence. So I wanna to talk to you briefly about coherence, and then let's, let's do this technique. We'll experience it together and we're going to do it through every one of the modules that we experience in this course. The optimum frequency to harmonize the heart and the brain is a very, very low frequency, 0 0.1 hertz. So low you can't really even hear it. It's like right on the threshold of where you can, you can feel and hear. It's a very powerful frequency. 0 0.1 hertz is the frequency that whales communicate with in the oceans because it is such a universal frequency. Now, I want you to know why this is such a powerful frequency. And I am really happy to talk to you about this because my primary degree is as an earth scientist, geophysics. I love to talk about the earth, about our planet. 0 0.1 hertz gives me the opportunity to do that. What you're looking at on your screen right now, this is a cross section of our beautiful planet. And you're seeing in the cross section, the magnetic fields that surround and protect us. Now this is an artist's conception. The next image you see, this one here, is actually a NASA image from a satellite in space looking back on the planet. So Earth 
is the ball, obviously the dark ball in the center. And the magnetic fields, the multiple layered magnetic fields are surrounding our planet. But if you look closely, what you're seeing on the left-hand side of the screen, you're seeing that those magnetic fields are deformed, they're flattened. And the reason is because the sun, the energy from the sun is coming from the left-hand side of your screen, 93 million miles across space. The energy from the sun the solar wind, the plasma, it's pushing against those magnetic fields. It's deforming those magnetic fields as they protect us and our planet. It is also doing something else. If you look closely, there's not one field. There are many, many different fields within the field. You can think of these fields as the strings on a musical instrument. I'm a musician. So I'm a guitar player, so I think of this in terms of guitar. So if you look closely, what you're seeing is those magnetic lines are in motion because the energy from the sun is touching them. So I'm going to invite you to think of it like this. Think about the energy from the sun plucking each of those, those strings of the magnetic field, and when it plucks them, it makes a sound. And I have that sound for you. I want to share this with you because we now have the ability to listen to what the magnetic fields of our planet or any planet sound like. It may surprise you. And a lot of people, when they think about the magnetic fields, they think it's going to be like this angelic, uh, very high-pitched, soft sound. That's not what this is. It is a deep, resonant, intense sound I want to play this for you because I want you to listen. It is sounds within sounds, harmonics that are happening. And then we'll talk about that in just, uh, just a little bit. So the next image, this is, this is what this sound actually sounds like. I want you to hear this. And I'm going to bring it up for you gradually. I want you to listen close to these sounds. You can hear the harmonics and one sound inside of another. Pretty amazing, huh? So what this says to us is that these fields, and once again, I want you to know this is real. You are actually tapping into these fields in a very profound way. And that's the next thing I want to share with you before we have the actual technique and the experience. I don't want this to be technical, but I want you to see the chart you're seeing. It's called Earth's Magnetic Field Line Resonance Frequencies. All I want you to know is this. Look at the first spike you see on that chart. And if you look at the axis on the bottom, it's not zero and it's not 0 0.2. Guess where that spike is. Just take a wild guess. Where do you think that spike is? If you guess 0 0.1, you're right on. And if that number looks familiar, it should, because that is precisely the frequency that optimizes the relationship between the heart and the brain. 0 0.1 hertz. Why am I saying this to you? I'm saying this because when you harmonize your heart and your brain together, not only are you harmonizing the heart and the brain, and the systems of the body. But look at this, you're harmonizing your entire body to the fundamental frequency of the magnetic field of the planet you live on. Wow, what a powerful thing to do. You're bringing your body and all the systems of your body into alignment with the magnetic field of this planet. That's a powerful thing to do. This is where your healing begins. This is where your healing begins. And there's a very good reason for this because not only are you optimizing and aligning the heart and the brain. If you look at the chart on your screen right now, this is an amazing chart. If you can't read it, don't worry because neither can anyone else. This is a chart of the metabolic pathways in the human body. And what it says to you is everything is connected to everything else. Everything in the body is connected to everything else. This is the reason if you take an antihistamine, for an allergy. Yeah, it takes care of the allergy and it may make you sleepy. They'll tell you, don't drive while you're doing this, or it can affect other, other aspects in, in your biology. This is the reason, because everything's connected. Well, this connection is good news. 
Because what it means is when you harmonize the heart and the brain, that harmony is not limited to the heart and the brain. This chart tells you. It now is extended to every organ in the body, all the systems in the body, the reproductive systems, the respiratory systems, the cardiovascular systems, the neural networks, everything is harmonized, optimized. Think of it like this. When you use the technique we're about to use, it's like saying to your body, all systems are go. All systems are go. So now that we understand the power of coherence within our bodies and that we have the ability to create coherence between our heart and our brains, the harmony between the heart and the brain and the entire body, all the systems in the body, let's do it. Let's do this technique. This is my favorite slide. I'm gonna play just a little music in the background just to average out any other sounds that might be happening around us. Once again, I'm gonna invite you, please be in a place that's safe to do this. Don't do this if you're driving. If you haven't done so already, I'm gonna invite you to close your eyes. Allow your awareness to move from your thinking mind into your feeling heart. And I'm gonna do the same thing right here because we're in this together. Just allow your awareness to move from your mind to your heart. What our ancestors have told us and what they teach in their traditions is that can help to focus our awareness in our heart if we gently touch our heart center in a way that's comfortable. It could be a full hand, a full palm over the heart center. It can be a finger, two fingers. In the Buddhist tradition, they create a prayer mudra and nestle that mudra gently into the hollow of the chest. Whatever feels appropriate, whatever feels right for you. I invite you to gently touch your heart center and allow your awareness to go to the place where you feel that touch. This is the first step. In the second step, I'm gonna invite you to slow your breathing, just a little bit slower than you would typically breathe. Now there is a code, there's a ratio to optimizing a slower breath. And the secret is this, you want to allow the exhale of the breath to be longer than the inhale. Everyone breathes differently. So I'm going to recommend that we do maybe five seconds on the inhale, eight seconds on the release, but you do whatever is comfortable for you. Let's do this together. With your awareness, with your focus in your heart center, gently touching your heart, step one, step two, I invite you to breathe just a little bit slower. Inhale, begin. And release. Just feel that shift in your body. Inhale again. And release. Focusing on your heart center one more time, inhale. Release. To the best of your ability, if you can continue breathing just about that pace. Step number three, I'm gonna invite you to have a feeling, positive, life-affirming, uplifting feeling in your body. And while there are many feelings that may work for simplicity and for continuity, I'm gonna invite you to feel gratitude. Gratitude works pretty much all the time for everyone, and the scientists have shown us that it's almost universal. When we feel that gratitude and we say thank you for the good things in my life, for my family, for my community, for my health, for my healing. That feeling is what triggers the coherence between the heart and the brain. So while you focus on your heart and continue a slow breath, to the best of your ability, feel that feeling of gratitude. And I'm gonna do the same right now.
And just continue breathing. With one more breath, I'm going to invite you to inhale. And as you release that breath, gently begin to open your eyes, become present in the place that you've created for yourself. Please don't be deceived by the simplicity of what we have just done. What the science shows us is that these three simple steps have been refined from thousands of years of experience, of human experience, of learning how to set this process in our bodies. From only three minutes of this technique, we reduce our cortisol levels, the stress, stress hormones, about 23% in the body. We elevate DHEA, the precursor to all the hormones in our body, 100%, just from three minutes of doing what we're doing and we optimize this relationship between the heart and the brain. This is the place where you want to now insert the word codes. And I also want you to know, of course, uh, that I have developed content. I've developed a course, a nine module course that explores nine different wisdom codes. It explores where they come from, their origin, each code, the history of where it comes from, the science underlying the wisdom code, what it means, and perhaps most importantly, we apply it together in each module of this course, real time, you and I do this together. So if you're, if you're drawn to what I'm saying to you, if this resonates with you, I want you to know that there is more that you can go to. Uh, and I hope to see you in that course. And if I never see you again, I'm honored to have been able to share some time with you today. Thank you for sharing a bit of your day and, and your trust in me for allowing me to share what I've found to be true with you from our past. And I want you to know there is a continuity. There is a continuity between our ancestors and us. You can think of them as separate, but in reality, we stand on the shoulders of everything that they've learned, that they applied in their lives. And perhaps most importantly, while science may be only 300 years old, our ancestors' lineage goes back over 5,000 years in civilization. For 5,000 years, those who have come before us, they weren't trying to prove the relationships. What they were doing was exploring the applications. For 5,000 years, they said, this is how you use these understandings, these wisdom codes in your personal life, in your family life, in your community life, and in applying these, they got to work out the bugs. They got to find out what works and what doesn't. We benefit from all of that today. So this is what I wanted to share with you today. If you're interested, go to uh, the Unity website, check out uh, the Wisdom Codes course, Ancient Words to Rewire Our Brains and Heal Our Hearts is the subtitle for the course. Thank you so much once again, and um, I look forward to seeing you for our next.